Hello, and welcome to the fifth episode of The Dark Money Files, in which we shine a light into a murky world. I'm Ray Blake, and with me is my co-host, friend and business partner, Graham Barrow. Hello, Graham. Hi, Ray. As promised in episode four, we're going to continue our exploration of the Danske Bank statements, this time looking at what we call the deal, by which we mean, as far as we can tell, some of the final destinations for some of these large sums of money now thoroughly laundered. Graham. How are we going to do this? Ray, it has occupied my mind quite a bit this week. These podcasts are a, a fantastic way of bringing these stories to a busy audience. But one of the challenges is how do we present what is sometimes and what's going to be complex information in an easy to understand manner? And what have you come up with from all this pondering? Well, I've pondered to the point that I've selected three destination countries and done an analysis of the funds being sent to each of those countries. That sounds reasonable. I imagine the money when it came out of the laundry went in all sorts of different directions, so it makes sense to focus just on a small number of countries. Which three countries did you go for? I went for the UK, uh, Latvia and Spain. That's quite an eclectic mix. Um, I can guess why you chose the UK, but the other two? Uh, Well, I chose Latvia because it's had quite a troubled recent history in relation to money laundering. The UK, as you probably guessed, because it's constantly in the press as a home for dirty money. And Spain, well, because I just happened to notice one or two quite interesting payments and just wanted to follow up on them. Okay, where do you want to start? Well, let's start with Spain, as it's probably the most straightforward. Now, lots of people will know that Spain's Costa Brava is home to quite a few UK villains. Um, There's a joint Spanish-UK effort called Operation Captura, which to date has led to the arrest of 74 wanted criminals. You you know some amazing facts, Ray. I just do my homework, Graham. Um, I'm going to guess that your stuff doesn't include any of those 74 or any other Brits. Uh, No. Uh, As you know, most of the activity on the account statements I have involves corporate entities of one form or another, so it is always particularly interesting when the names of individuals appear on them. Mm. And who are those individuals for Spain? Uh, Well, as you know, Ray, I can't name names. And and to be honest, in this case, there's really no way that I would do so even if I could. There is a sequence of payments in one of the accounts I have, which all say the same thing. Entrusting of money for the paying of property. Now, that in itself is quite an odd thing to appear in the bank statements for a commercial undertaking why would a company be paying money to an individual to make a payment for them yes it is odd and and even more intriguingly the overwhelming majority of these payments are made to accounts with spanish ibans in the name of russian or russian sounding account holders Hmm. okay um uh, well i understand why you're not inclined to name names on this one should we um should we move on uh, yes, let's let's talk about the UK. Now, I suspect at this point many of our listeners will be expecting an avalanche of information. Uh, yes, and the reality is it's going to be more of a gentle flurry. Oh, any particular reason why? Well, nothing, nothing concrete. Uh, what are your thoughts, Ray? Well, I would have expected, if it's true to form, that lots of the dark money coming out of the laundry would be heading the UK's way. Um The UK is quite specifically targeted as a final destination for dark money, and most of that ends up in property, almost always bought through legal entities though, most of which will be registered in offshore locations to mask the ultimate owners and controllers of the money, which means the route into the UK is usually a bit more circuitous than than just the payment to um, an individual person. Yeah, I think you're right. Um... Most of the payments into the UK that I've looked at are actually quite mundane. Have you got an example? Yeah, um, for one account there was a payment of €957 for belts. That seems quite a lot of money for belts. Well it does, but a bit of further research confirmed that the company the money was remitted to was actually incorporated in 1938 and specialises in making rotary belts for biscuit manufacturers. So these belts were the type that sat in an industrial biscuit-making machine. Uh, That's fairly niche, isn't it, Graham? 
Yeah, it's kind of weird but oddly normal in its own way, which which then causes you to start wondering whether these accounts may not actually be legitimate until something else catches your eye and, and dispels that particular myth. Ah, oh, go on then. Well, there's another payment from the same account for €5,931, which is labelled for tools. Now, that seems entirely plausible. Well, yes, except the payee is a is a well-known high-end jewellery retailer. In fact, Ray, it's one which you've walked past in the city with just monotonous regularity. The sort of place where a simple pair of cufflinks starts at £200 and rapidly increases from there. Um... But they don't sell tools. Uh, no. OK. Anything else? Yeah, just there were a couple of intriguing payments to a now dissolved company based in Wembley in West London. Oh, well, that's near both of us. Um, it is. How much for? Uh, just under €550,000. Oh, nice. Did this Wembley company file accounts? They did, and for 2008, the year in question, their cash at bank was listed as being £8,470, and the profit and loss account showed a balance of £1,225. Which is quite a small amount to show um, for their €550,000 inflow. Uh, Yes, Uh, yes. Um, Not conclusive, though, but they... The fact pattern doesn't correlate terribly well. No, it it doesn't. Um, And the other thing was the company had quite an interesting director. He's actually the director of more than 600 companies altogether. Mm, Busy chap. Um, All UK companies? Well, no. According to Open Corporates, 509 were in the UK, but the rest were spread across Cyprus, Panama, Denmark, New Zealand and Wyoming. Mm. So he gets about a bit as well. Um, Wyoming's an odd one. Well, it is. I mean, there's one company incorporated there, which is named after a holy city in India, with this chap who's, who's British, but he lives in Cyprus, named as its president. And the registered address is in Lanzarote in the Canary Islands. Well, of course it is, Graham. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's move on. Anything else in the UK accounts worth mentioning? Well, no, that, that really is it. Oh, OK. Um, so lastly, Latvia. Did you find anything of interest there? Yes. Now, this is where things do get a bit more complex, but it, it was worth the effort. It was a bit of effort putting this together and it'll be a bit of effort explaining it. And I guess for our listeners, a bit of effort understanding it. But it's yeah, I think it's worth it. Um, it's worth it because it's going to relate once more to the Magnitsky affair. So, Ray, look, do you want to do a little introduction to the story for those who may not be fully aware of what happened. Sure. Sergei Magnitsky was a specialist tax accountant who worked for a Russian law firm called Firestone Duncan, uh, which, as you might guess from its name, was founded by an American. Magnitsky was hired to investigate alleged tax fraud involving one of the firms owned by Bill Browder, who at the time was the largest foreign investor in Russia through his hedge fund, which was called Hermitage. Magnitsky came to believe that the fraud on Hermitage was perpetrated by those within the Russian police and tax systems, an assertion that led to his subsequent arrest and imprisonment, where he eventually died in circumstances that have consistently pointed to foul play. Bizarrely, and for the first time in Russian history, Magnitsky was then tried posthumously by the Russian authorities and found guilty of tax fraud, as was Browder in absentia. A significant number of people associated with this case have since either died or or nearly died in strange or unusual circumstances, a story we'll be coming back to in a later podcast. Thanks, Ray. That's a really good explanation. Um, How much was involved in this alleged tax fraud visited on Hermitage? Uh, $230 million, Graham. OK, well, that's pretty big by most standards, but, but oddly, it's not a large percentage of the total funds that flowed through Danska in Estonia, is it? Uh, no, but it's certainly one of the most scrutinised flow of funds which went through these accounts, which does mean there's more available for researchers than any other case we know of. Now, that is so true, and it will become very relevant for the case I'm about to talk about. OK, so where does this begin, then? You mentioned Latvia. 
Yes, that's right. Our starting point is the Latvian bank account of our 32nd UK LLP. Now, hang on. In the last episode, you said you'd found two more LLPs that you'd missed first time round, bringing the total to 31. You're now saying there's 32. Are you telling me you missed another one? Um, yes, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure how, as it should have been caught by my search string, but it, it wasn't. So there may still be more? Uh, possibly, yep. OK, and did this one fall into the usual pattern? No, and that's what makes it so interesting. So do you want to explain why? Well, yeah. So um, first of all, it was incorporated slightly earlier than most of the others in March 2005. And secondly, it didn't have Ireland and Overseas and Milltown as its original designated members. Didn't it? Who were they then? Well, as they've stayed under the radar up to now, I'm not going to name them, but you might be interested to know that their address was just down the road from Ireland and overseas in Belize. Oh, was it? Yeah, they were at number five and Ireland and overseas were at number 35. Uh, They were designated members to around 20 or so UK LLPs, all of which are now dissolved. I'm going to be honest here, Graham. That's vaguely interesting, but I'm not particularly excited. Um, Agreed. But then they resigned and were replaced by two new designated members. Also from Belize? Uh, no. Have, a, have another guess. Oh, I don't know. Um, Nevis? Marshall Islands? Dominica? BVI? Cayman? Yep. No, no, none of those. Vanuatu. Vanuatu? Yeah, that's not quite so common, is it? No, you don't see many of those. Um, Although, to be fair, the new designated members are or have been associated with a total of 58 UK LLPs, so it's not unique, but it is unusual. And how many payments did they receive from the Dansker account? Just the one. Oh, so it wasn't excessively involved then? No, and uh, to be honest, if it hadn't been a UK LLP, I probably wouldn't have bothered even looking. But because they have been central to my investigations, I just, I always double check. So how much was this one payment for, then? Um, uh, €130,182. And again, in the scheme of things, not a huge amount of money. Any accounts filed by this company? Yes, 11 sets from 2005 until it was dissolved in 2017, which was about 18 months after the last account filing. And what did these 11 sets of accounts say? Every one of them uh, said it was a dormant company. Now, a dormant company is one that isn't actively trading and doesn't have any profit and loss to report to company's house. So we have an LLP here that ran for 11 years or so. Um, It had two sets of designated members, one set in Belize and one set in Vanuatu. Never actually traded, despite receiving 130-odd thousand euros into an account in Latvia, sent from an account in Estonia in 2008. Yes. Now, this is almost turning into a catchphrase, Graham, the amount I use this phrase, but that doesn't make any sense. (laughs) No, Ray, it it doesn't. And did this firm have any internet presence? Well, um, I did find this lady on LinkedIn uh, in Kazakhstan who claims to have worked for them doing English-Russian translations between 2013 and 2014. Does she have a wide network? Uh, No, she has no connections whatsoever. You really do end up in some weird corners of the internet, Graham, don't you? Yeah, but it's all in a good cause. Okay, all very interesting, but I'm getting the feeling this isn't the whole story. Well, no. Um, The next set of payments I came across, going to a Latvian bank, were paid to a very well-known company at the centre of the Magnitsky case. And as it happens, this company was set up in New Zealand. Blimey, New Zealand is becoming almost as popular as the UK in these stories. Was it the same people we mentioned in the last episode? No, it was a different group this time, but also with a very chequered history. I'm not seeing the connection yet, though. No, except I knew that there were some copies of Swift messages available for this company, which might just prove interesting. Swift messages. I think we should explain quickly, for those who don't know, what they are. Oh, away you go then. OK, so Swift is an acronym. Um, essentially, Swift messages are a way of sending money around the world. They're not money transfers themselves, but messages between banks authorising payments to be made. 
The messages are encrypted and in standard formats, which almost all banks recognise. And very often they travel through correspondent accounts, as not all transfers go direct from one bank to another. Thanks, Ray. That's a great explanation. Uh, that means that SWIFTs, like IBANs, carry interesting information. And, and the two I knew of actually carried the IBANs for the same account as the one on the Danske statement. So it was definitely the same account? Yes, and it was with a bank called Trusta Commerce Banker, which has since closed down following the revocation of its banking licence for some pretty serious anti-money laundering violations. OK, again, very interesting. Not getting the connection still. No, well, alongside the SWIFT messages uh, is a scan of a New Zealand registry entry which, which led me back to open corporates to make sure it was genuine, and it was. And it revealed that the director of this Magnitsky company was from uh, Vanuatu. Vanuatu? Yeah, and not just that, but the address given on the New Zealand corporate registry is exactly the same one as the new designated members gave for the UK LLP we mentioned just now. Everything really is connected, isn't it? Um, yes, and, and that is such an important part of these podcasts. Although the sources for all this dark money are often very different, at, at some point or other it does enter this European washing machine, which by and large is operated by the same group, with tentacles spreading literally all around the world. I feel like I'm being really greedy now, Graham, but is there anything else? Ray, there is. There, there's a third company um, based in Latvia, which was also really central to the Magnitsky money, which this time remitted money into the Dansker account. Oh, into the Dansker account. OK, how much? Ray, Ray it was it was $997,400. <laughs> of course it was, Graham. Uh, it, it's, it's truly remarkable just how often we see these amounts which are just under a million. Um, we really have to do an episode based on a Benford's law analysis. It would be very revealing, I think. Um, I think we should, and I think this time we'll leave it to our audience to discover just what Benford's Law is all about. Yeah, and, and those of you who do, it's really worth it. You'll, you'll absolutely love it. Um, so, back to the money. Do we know which bank in Latvia the money was remitted from? Yes, it was also Trasso Commerce Banker. And was this also a New Zealand company? Uh, no, it was registered in the UK. Uh, you're not going to tell me it was registered in 2006, are you? Ah, uh, Ray, you are sometimes amazing. It was actually registered in <laughs> August 2006. Where's the registered office? It's in uh, Birmingham, Ray. Ah, Birmingham again. Um, wasn't there a Cypriot lady who was the director of lots of the New Zealand companies who featured in the last episode who was also a director of UK companies registered to an account in Birmingham? Uh, there was, and you'll be really pleased to know it includes this one. No. Yep. Hold on. So every one of these accounts has links to other accounts, which have links to other accounts. They really are all connected. Yes. Uh, would you like two last little interesting tidbits of information? Oh, go on then. Well, there are 22 pages of bank statements for this third company, which are available online thanks to the OCCRP, who we mentioned in a previous episode. Now, those statements contain payments from UK LLPs, none of which I've seen before, but all of which banked at Danska in Estonia all of which were registered to the same address in Ells Court, and all of them had Ireland and Overseas and Milltown as their designated members. Not just that, this third company also received a huge bunch of payments from two New Zealand companies, which again, I'd never seen before, but they all came from Danska Estonia, and both of those companies were registered at the same address as the 10 that we mentioned in the last episode. Uh, of course they were. Um, now, you promised me two tidbits. What's the other? Well, this last company also had a Cypriot corporate director, as well as the lady we mentioned earlier. Now, because Open Corporates uses the open data format, it can link the same entity or person across different jurisdictions. So it was immediately apparent that this particular entity was also involved in legal entities, not just in the UK, but in one other jurisdiction. Mm, which was? 
uh, Denmark. Ooh, Denmark again. Yeah, and, and not just Denmark, but in, in what are known as KS companies, which are equivalent to our limited partnerships. And they got a very special and specific mention in the Brun and Hjela report as a particular cause for concern. And do we know if these were the self-same companies? Sadly, Ray, no, we, we don't. But I think that does lead us to episode six of The Dark Money Files, which we'll be recording after a short break. Um, we've been working flat out to get these episodes out weekly. and We need to take a short pause to catch up a bit. Also, I think the story is moving in a direction that needs some, some quite time-consuming investigation. So, uh, listeners, you might have to wait an extra week for the next episode. Ah, which is? Well, I think we should finish off these very specific Danske Bank episodes with a review of the Brun and Kjela report and see if we can dig under the words to find out what it's really telling us. Uh, I think the authors were very careful indeed with their wording. And if I'm right, that allowed them to seed it with clues that wouldn't mean much to most readers, but for those who know, it speaks quite clearly. This sounds very intriguing indeed, Graham. Tell me more. Ray, I will, in the next episode. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Dark Money Files. We hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to listen to future episodes, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or your normal podcast provider. Thanks.